Greetings, and today we will be reading The Mexican Revolution by Adolfo Guigui. I, I, I honestly don't know how to pronounce the last name, but I got this at the library the other day, and I wanted to read it with, with you guys. Uh, this is my, I, I'm, a, I'm in a blind, blind reading as well, so forgive me if I, arti if I can't articulate. It's just that uh, I can't articulate. Sorry. But let's begin with Chapter 1, Capitalist Development. Much more than any, than any other Latin American country, Mexico won its independence from Spain through a popular war whose principal leaders, clergymen Miguel Hildigo and Jose, and Jose Maria Merol, Morelos, Morelos I, were also representatives of the Jacobin, Jacobin wing of the revolution. As elsewhere in Latin America, however, it was not this wing that can... That, consummated victory or began the task of organizing the newly independent country, but rather the conservative tendencies that in the course of the struggle were able to eliminate the radical wing, as a result, the decline of the people's intervention in the war. The revolution of independence was a class war, and its nature cannot be understood correctly unless we recognize the fact that unlike what happened in South America, it was an agrarian revol revolt and gestation. This is why the army, with its criollos like Agustin de Etruvede, the church and the great landowners supporting the Spanish crown, and these were the forces that defeated Hildigo. Morales and Javier Mina wrote October pa Oct Octavio Paz in The Labyrinth of Solitude. Mexico also bore the full brunt of the first expansive thrust by the U.S. Capitalization, capitalism. In 1847, following a course began years earlier with the Texas War, the United States invaded the country and took possession of half its territory, some two million square kilometers, comprising the present-day state of Texas, Nevada, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, and California. Although British domination was then growing in the world, and particularly in Latin America, youthful North Americans' capital capitalism acquired its living space by seizing Mexican land in the matter of the old wars of conquest. This plunder, which left its mark in the memory of the Mexican people, was subsequently legalized by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hildigo, signed in February 1848. Some ten years passed before the rise of nationality nationally conscious forces entered on Benito Juarez and his group of liberal politicians who were able to organize the foundations of modern Mexico. Their social base was those sections of the emergent bourgeoisie who saw a new mode of entrance into the world trade and restructuring of the Mexican market and international space. In 1855, the Ayunta Revolution carried the Liberal Party to power on a program involving an or the organization of capitalist development. Its main objective was to break legal fet fetters on the extensive of capitalist relations and on the expansion of the international market, beginning with the capitalist land market itself. In 1856, the Liberals passed a distant Disentailment Act that prohibited religious and civil bodies from owning more land than they needed to carry out for their functions. Any excess was to be sold to the tenants, on the basis that the annual re re rental required 6% of value, or if they did not buy it, to anyone who made a suitable application. In this way, the liberals set out to create a class of agrarian smallholders, placing on the market not only the lands of the clergy, but also, through the liquidation of old communal property structures, the land of the Indian communities. The liberal principles of the reform were ratified in the 1857 Constitution. Throughout Latin America, with peculiarities de determined by each country's prior development and incip incipient entrance into the New World market, the, judici the judicial base of bourgeois national organization were beginning to make to take shape at a level generally much more advanced than the, the social force or economic and cultural development of the country in question. In certain sense, then, the judicial principles of 1857 constitution were those of an imaginary country, a liberal utopia that fired and guided the imagination of its authors, but was only partially embodied in its methods and relationship to the real country. The clergy and the big latifundistas group in the conservative party rose up against the reform legislation. They enjoyed the, ide the ideological support of Pope P.S. Uh, 
This is a Roman numeral, so I'm gonna guess it's the six. Correct me if I'm wrong, it's a big I and X, so I'm gonna guess it's six, but correct me if I'm wrong. Who declared non null and void both these laws and the Mexican Constitution itself. The ensuing Reform War, continuing in the war against the French intervention, lasted until 1867. In 1862 and 1863, the conservatives received help from invading French troops who placed Maximilian of Habsburg on the throne as Emperor of Mexico. Napoleon III's, imperial, Napoleon's, Napoleon III's imperialist adventure in Mexico, in which the United States, following its own interests, supported the Mexican liberals, ended with the withdrawal of the defeated French forces. In June 1867, on the Guadalajara Heights, Maximilian was shot alongside his two Mexican army commanders, Miramon and Mejia. The liberal victory opened, opened the road to capitalism in Mexico, a country which, at the time, had 8 or 9 million inhabitants in its 2 million square kilometers. As in every struggle during the rise of the bourgeoisie, the barely nascent Mexican bourgeoisie had to rely upon popular support and Jacobian methods in order to sweep away the institutions and structures inherited from colonial times that now impeded its development. Karl Marx defined Jacobism as the plebeian method of settling accounts with the feudal enemies of the bourgeoisie. In its struggle against the clergy landowners and invading French troops, Juarez's faction based itself upon a national war and decreed such sweeping measures as the 1859 nationalization of the church property. This same law prescribed the, com the complete separation of churches and state, the secularization of all religious orders, a ban on religious congregation, and the nationalization of the clergy's rule and urban property. The radical character of Jewish liberalism, liberaz, liber, liberalism, liberalism would leave a powerful imprint upon the formal structures of the Mexican judicial, judicial system and coexisting with a strange symbiosis with the deeply religious beliefs of the people. It would also mark the thinking of all left-wing currents rooted in the national reality, even though they were not always aware of it. The main result of the reform legislation, however, was not the rise of the new class of smallholders, which can never be created by laws, but the further concentration of agrarian property in Latifundia. Thus, in the years after the legislation came into effect, not only the church's property, but also lands of the Indian rural communities were divided into small plots, soon to be acquired at the religious price, or else directly seized by Bay Lef Latifundistas in region. For many decades, the Latifunda would grow by devouring Indian communal land, particularly in the central, most pop most populous region of the country, and turning the Indian peasants into pawns of the, of the big landowners. The path was different in less populated north, a region marginal to colonial development which had no fixed indigenous population. In these huge, arid, mountainous stretches of land, above all Sonado and Chihuahua, nomadic Indian, Indian tribes resisted the white and mestizo settlers until the middle of the 1880s. Captured land had to be continually protected from the Apaches, so that apart that from big latifunda like Luis Esterizas' 2 million hectare holdings in Chihuahua, a rural middle class sprang upon relatively small and medium-sized ranches, or many haciendas. It should not be forgotten, however, that in 1870, the northern states of Sorona, Sinola, and Baja California only spent 3% of Mexico's total population. It was in this way that capitalist relations spread in the Mexican countryside throughout Porfirio Diaz's decade, with only four, with only one four-year interval with Manuel Gonzalez, a trusted replacement, took the helm. The regime lasted 35 years, from 1876 until 1911. During this period, the government passed a number of settlement acts, under which so-called surveying companies were set up to enclose common land and attract foreign settlers to work on it. As a payment for their services, these companies were left with a third of the land in question, belonging to a small government-linked oligarchy, which had enclosed some 49 million hectares by 1906, a quarter of Mexico's territory. There was no such quantity of common land. So there were companies that were really the organizational form through, wh through which land was violently seized from the peasant villages and communities. Thus, the huge latifunda of the central region swept up the whole village population as hacienda, poets, or laborers. 
so that's where I'm gonna finish here. I uh, I know I can't exactly read out loud well, but uh, yeah, just tell me what you think of this and. If you continue, I will reread these first four pages. Yes, four pages for ten minutes, alright? And if you did like it, well then, uh, I will redo this, these first four pages and read the actual chapter. Alright, Maze Man, out.